shall prosper. Yes. It also says we are more than conquerors. That's right. Not Amen. only do we win, Amen. but we win with benefit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen.
never let go of me. Lord, never. God, you never let go. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. What a beautiful day, Lord. have your way. This morning, Lord, prepare our hearts, God. Holy, holy. 
source of life I can't be left behind no one else will do no one else father I will lay hold of you and I need you Jesus to come to my rescue tell me where else where else can I go there's no other name by which I am saved captured me with grace and I need you Jesus to come to my rescue tell me where Lord where else can I go nothing for me this world has nothing for me this world has nothing for me to my rescue tell me where else can I go there's no other name by which I am saved captured me with grace I will follow you I will follow you this world has nothing for Thank you. Father, you are the source of life. This morning we come before you. God, feed us. Come on, church. Amen. I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue today. God, I need you. I'm ready. God, my heart is prepared. My life is ready to be fed, to be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3 is where I'm starting. Man, what a great, great morning. I'm going to call this, uh, the, the title of this message is Prepare the Way. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible tells us, speaking of John the Baptist. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and start at verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 3, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his paths straight. So the, the Bible tells us a story. We know Jesus. We know John the Baptist. We, you know, some of us, as we've, we've been through, we've studied things. We know that John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, some called him uh, Elijah, who came to, to prepare the way for, for Jesus to fulfill prophecies that were made some people you have to understand the prophecy was made because God had a plan to send John the Baptist to prepare the way what did that mean do you you know I, I think do you think Jesus needed somebody to tell him where to go no did you did you, you think Jesus needed somebody you know as an opening act I mean you know you're going to raise the dead how much opening act do you need you're going to calm the seed. Do you think you need an opening act? You don't need an opening act 
when you're God incarnate in the world. So the Bible says that God sent John the Baptist to prepare the way. What was the way? Was it for Jesus? No. Jesus didn't need John the Baptist. Who needed John the Baptist? Those who would come in contact with Jesus needed their hearts prepared. And John the Baptist went forth preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven. He went forth putting the idea into the hearts of people that a change is coming. Something big is about to happen. Something that is, something is about to take hold that will change your life forever. It will change all precepts of what you were thought in, in the past. It will it'll change the course of your life. It is going to be the greatest thing that has ever happened to the earth. And John the Baptist began to go out and prepare the people so that when it occurred, they wouldn't miss it. So John the Baptist's message was to the people. He went out and he began to preach, repent, and baptize, and getting people ready for a new thing, for something different, something that was about to happen. And he began to go out and prepare the way, so that the people would be ready to receive it. John's message was to the people, not to make some, some path so Jesus knew which way to go. In Malachi chapter 3, Malachi is the, first, is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi would have, would have been like our revelation. As we read Revelation today, we read it and it says to us, you know, that God is coming back. And we would read Revelation and, it's, we're, and we're now in this anticipation, right, of Jesus coming back. Malachi was the Old Testament version of our New Testament revelation. And for 500 years, you have a world that is waiting for this person who said was going to be coming here in Malachi. It was their last book. So here they are with their last book, the book of Malachi, waiting for this promise that is to come. And so the the Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, says, Behold. I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. So here is their revelation, their last book of their Bible. Here is that last book, and they get this message. There's one coming who's going to prepare the way, and then suddenly the Lord is going to show up. So God is, is teaching us something. Now, I wanna, let's do a little history. John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. They, they, they knew each other. Their families knew each other. So six months, John the Baptist was born. Six months later, Jesus Christ was born. John the Baptist becomes or is this messenger to begin to prepare the way, tell the people, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus was there. Okay, when John the Baptist started telling people prepare the way, it wasn't because there was a that, that there was this distant thing about to happen. It wasn't because in the near in the future something. It was because Jesus Christ was on the scene and about and ready to begin. Matter of fact, Jesus begins to act on the scene before John the Baptist is done. John the Baptist is still telling people, prepare the way, prepare the way. And the master, the Lord, is on the scene beginning to act as he's telling them. The Bible says, suddenly. (laughs) Suddenly, it was happening at the same time. That's sudden. All right? Prepare the way. He began to try to get the hearts of people to understand what was about to happen in the time of history. In the, in, the, in, the, in the time that was to come, prepare the way, prepare the way. So John began to go and began to preach, and he began to share, telling them, you know, be, repent, repent, get ready, repent, turn from your way, but get ready, because God is going to do something new and powerful. Prepare the way. Job chapter 11. Turn to Job chapter 11. I like, I like Job. The story of Job, I, it, it, you know, people tell the story of Job, and they tell, it's like 40-some chapters in the book of Job, and they tell the first chapter and the last chapter in the whole story of Job. <laughs> but Job chapter 11. Now, Zophar, 
And all I could find out about Zophar, if you know more than, about, than that about me, that's great, is he was one of Job's friends. That's about the only thing I could find out. He was one of Job's friends. And he began to talk to Job and to encourage Job in verse, verse 13. And he tells Job, he said, Job, if you prepare your heart and stretch out your hands toward him, if iniquity be in your hand, Put it far away from you, and let not wickedness dwell in your tabernacles. For then shall you lift up your face without spot. Yea, you shall be steadfast and not fear. Verse 16, because you shall forget the misery and remember it as waters that pass away. Come on, have you, ever, you ever can't wait to, to remember the things that are happening, the bad things that are just pounding up on your life? You ever, you ever get excited about when they look like a river flowing away? Whew. <laughs> said set your heart begin to begin to prepare your heart it said and set your heart and, and purify your life he said you'll remember him like this verse 17 and your age shall be clearer than noonday and you shall shine forth and you shall be as the morning verse 18 and you shall be secure because there is hope yea there shall there you shall dig about you and there shall take away your rest in safety Job answers him in verse 12, and he answers him kind of like this. Yeah, no kidding. Everybody knows that. <laughs> that's why he basically Job's like, well, yeah, that's not a new word. Prepare your heart. Get ready for God. Purify your life, and God will break through. Everybody knows that, Job said. <laughs> but my question is, I don't think everybody does know that. I don't think everybody knows that we have a responsibility to prepare the way for God to do something in our life. Many of us have struggles, we have, we have turmoil, we have problems, we have issues. We want to see God break through. We, we're, we, we'd like to see God do a, a miracle in our life. Some of you have, have, have addictions, maybe. You'd like to see God break you from them. Some of you may have just pure depression or frustration in your life, and you'd like to be broke free from that. Some of you would really like to see your life begin to happen. Something happened to me. <laughs> All right? And, and, and you're ready to do that. And the Bible says, prepare the way. What does that mean? Prepare the way. The word to prepare, it means to set, you know, set your fictions on or to move forward. What would you, if you prepare, it is a deliberate effort on your part over time to get ready. A deliberate effort on your part to get ready. When, when, when John the Baptist began to go forth and to begin to preach and begin to teach, what he was doing is he was telling the people, you want to experience something powerful in your life, you repent. You turn. You begin to prepare your heart to hear the message. You prepare the way. The Bible tells us that, that, many, that, that uh, many of the men in the Bible, and, and David, I remember David a lot. The Bible tells he would encourage himself in the Lord. He would get prepared before anything happened. He would make a, a, a deliberate effort to prepare his heart for victory, maybe. He would make a deliberate effort to prepare himself to see something happen in his life. He would begin to work and try to, try to make himself ready for God to move. Uh, uh, what, what I, I'm going to share with you, God is going to move. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. The power of God is going to be poured out. The Bible says, in my last day, I'll pour my spirit out upon all men. God is going to make changes in the lives of people. God is going to bring deliverance. He's going to bring healing. He's going to bring victory. He's going to bring power. God is going to bring his anointing and his power to the earth. He's going to do it. That isn't a question. It isn't an option. It, it is going to happen. The question and the option and the thing is, is your heart, is your life going to be prepared so when the heavens break open, you're going to even recognize what's going on? Are you going to be ready for God to break through for you? God's going to break through. God's power will be revealed. God's anointing, is God's word will not, will, the Bible says, will not pass away until everything be fulfilled. God is going to do what he said he would do. And what comes to play is, will you prepare your heart to let him do it? I, um, you know, I think about so many times in our lives when, when opportunity comes, you know. What is opportunity? You know, when opportunity comes, and the question is, are you ready? 
Do you know when opportunity shows up, you better not try to get ready? Uh, a few, you know, a few years ago, we had this huge crash. Everybody remember the crash, stock market going, doo, 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 doo. I'm watching it go down, and I'm watching it go down, and I'm watching it go down, and I'm going, oh, my baby, please, let's get some money. Put some money away. Let's try to put some money away, baby. Put the money away. And I'm watching that thing going boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, we got to have money. <laughs> Why? Because I knew something. I knew opportunity was about to spring forth in the world like you couldn't believe. I watched that market going, do, 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 do. I remember the day when it hit the bottom. And I didn't have a dime. And I thought to myself, you, mister, should have prepared for God to do something powerful in your life. And I didn't. And then there were more millionaires made over the return of the stock market over the last few years than in the previous years altogether. Did you know that? More people made money. Why? Because you have this huge return of the stock market. And I was sitting there looking at it going, I wish I would have prepared. I wish I would have been ready for that thing when it hit rock bottom. You could have thrown a dartboard at the stock market and picked any star stock the dart landed on. Uh-huh. It would have went up. Now, there are a few I know that went away, but for the majority of every stock out there, they went up. You could have bought almost anything and made money. But my heart went, why are you talking about money? Only because sometimes that's the only way to get people to get wake up. In God's spiritual realm, let me tell you something. He is preparing in the darkest part of our life, in the deepest pits, in the most, in the, in the, in the deepest places we've ever been. God is preparing something for you. And the question is, if your heart isn't ready, if your life isn't looking for him, if you're not awake and paying attention to what is going on, you'll miss it completely. God's presence will move on. The glory will come. The power will come. And you will not receive it. You'll be busy. Or doing something else and your heart won't be ready. Listen, my message is simple. God is going to move. God's going to move in this church. God's going to rock this church. I'm telling you right now, you need to get ready. You need to be ready to be one who's a partaker of the things that God is going to do. You need to prepare to be a part of whatever God is going to do. And some of that is in your own heart saying to God, God, I will turn. I will. I'll, I'll put my, my sin aside. I'll put my stuff aside. I'll begin to get my heart ready for whatever you want to use me for. I'll begin to prepare my life for the miracle, for the breakthrough. God, I'm going to prepare for you to do this in my life. Turn with me. Ezra, little book, Ezra. All right? I'm not there. Oops. Nope, nope, nope. I'm so sorry. Second Chronicles chapter 12. Second Chronicles chapter 12. Do you think, in all honesty, how many of you really believe that those who have done evil in the world, they just set out one morning to decide, you know what, I'm just going to be a bad person? I think I'm going to be just, I'm thinking I'm just going to be rotten, right? They don't, they don't set out to make a, 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 a point in their life say, you know what, I think I'm just, I'm just going to do a really bad job at everything I touch. The Ray of Bohem became the leader of Israel, and he began to rule. And the Bible says, verse 14 of Second Chronicles, chapter 12, verse 14, it says, and he did evil the entire time he was king because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. He, by default, became evil because he didn't prepare his heart to follow God. By default, he became evil. You with me? If we don't prepare our heart for victory, by default, we lose. Now you're getting quiet. If you don't prepare to win, you lose. If you don't prepare to do good, you do evil. It's just where we default to. Now you're looking at me because I freaked you out or something. And my message for you today is very simple. God wants you. 
He wants to change your life. He wants to rock your world. He wants to change everything you think about where you're at in your life. He wants to do something beyond what you could possibly imagine, be above you. Listen, I I'm telling you, God wants to do great things in your life. But if you do not prepare your heart, you will by default go to mediocrity. Come on, Pastor Dale. You will by default go to just getting by. I just want to make it to heaven. <laughs> Lord, have mercy, not me. Not me. I don't want to just make it to heaven. I do not want to just make it to heaven. I want to go to heaven with a whole group of band behind me, rocking out. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Busting through the gates with the amps roaring, you know. I don't want to just make it to heaven. I don't want to just get by. I don't want to just live. I don't want to just accidentally sneak my way in i don't want to just almost be free i want to be free i want to be healed i want to be alive i want to be effective i want to move forward and if i'm going to ever be there then i have to now before god's presence breaks through before the freedom comes before the deliverance happens before god rocks my entire world i gotta be ready now so that when god calls me i'll jump to it at that second you have to prepare your heart to say to God, okay, God, my heart is prepared to do what you've called me to do. My heart is prepared. You want to get me? Get me. <laughs> get me. Go ahead. Here I am. Do it. My heart is prepared for you to move on my life. Prepare your heart and be ready. Now, Ezra, chapter 7. Little book of Ezra. Ezra, chapter 7. Not a very big book in the Bible. It's small enough I'm having trouble finding it. It's right before Nehemiah, and it's right after Chronicles. So if you're in Chronicles, it's the next book. Ezra, chapter 7, verse 10. The Bible says, now Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgment. And the king sent a letter to Ezra and gave him permission to do exactly that. Now, let me tell you something. There's some things you may not know. Ezra set his heart to make sure that the people of Israel knew the word of God. He prepared his life to make sure the people... Ezra was a scribe. You know what a scribe was? He was one of those people who edited and wrote the word. He was one of those people who would, who would sit in a room with nobody around and nobody watching and write and work on the, 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 the word and rewrite it and, and, and fix the pages that were messed up and, and restore the pages onto new pages. Because the problem was in the Bible, the problem wasn't that the Bible w was wrong. It was that the paper was of such poor quality, the paper would disintegrate and Somebody had to keep writing it. Okay? Ezra was one of these people who sat in a, in, a, in a room somewhere. We know of this trip that Ezra took that the king sent him on. He went there. He began to establish or reestablish a, 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 a whole reformation. And an act began to happen that is, and, and that is contributed to this trip that he took where he began to teach people, hey, you guys are not obeying what the word has told us to do. And you need to fall in line with this. And it started this movement that happened. Ezra disappears off the scene, except that historians have told us that Ezra was, was the one who took the canon, all of Moses' books. The, he wrote the, the, uh, they believe he wrote the book of Chronicles that we see. They believe he wrote Ezra and Nehemiah. He was instrumental in all of, they say like 17 of the minor prophets. He put the entire Bible that they had at that day together in one canon for the first time ever. He established the Bible as one book and wrote it out according to historians and according to the Jewish people Ezra wrote and restored the entire Bible you don't even hardly hear his name <laughs> but he accomplished something that put a huge change he took all the books of Moses and the canon and began to put them together and write them out and established a canon that could be submitted as the works of the Holy Scripture boom here it is. Those people that have gone before that handed you a full Bible, it was nice, huh? 
That's what Ezra did for the canon of the Old Testament. Why? What an incredible work. What a powerful move. This man, his impact on the world still being seen in your lives today. You got a copy of the Old Testament? Yeah, still being seen in your lives today. This man's effort still going forth and making a huge uh, uh, c contribution to the entire world. And why? What happened? You want me to tell you what happened? Ezra, the Bible says, prepared his heart to the word. Read that again. Ezra 7, uh, 14. No, 7, 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach it in Israel, its statutes and judgments. Ezra set his heart to make sure that the people of Israel had the word and the statutes and the judgment of God. He prepared his heart. And something began to happen in his life. And he made a, a worldwide impact because of it. Listen to me. If you don't prepare your heart, if you don't, the power of God could move in this church. And you'll go right outside these doors and you won't be delivered. You won't be free. You won't be moved. Nothing will happen. Come on. You have to prepare your heart. Why did God send John the Baptist into the world? He sent John the Baptist out there to make sure the people's heart was ready. We know they rejected him. We know that they did by design. But when he was resurrected, there were many. The Bible says thousands were added to the church. Do you think they were added to the church because at that moment something happened to them? No, they were added to the church because their hearts had been prepared. Their hearts had been prepared. Listen, church, I'm telling you, listen to me. God is going to move. He is going to move in this church, in this town, and in this place. There are people who've been here since day one, and you're sitting back there thinking, yeah, sure, pastor. <laughs> Prepare your heart for a move of God. Get ready. Get ready. Get your heart thinking, God, what, can, what could you do? What could you use me for? How can my life be changed? God, I'm ready for you to do something. And when the doors begin to swing open and the power of God begins to break forth, you'll experience freedom. There are some of you in this room that are so bound. You're so stuck. Your life is so empty. Right? And God wants to break through and change everything for you. You need to realize, what, what was it? He said, prepare your heart that there is hope. Begin to set your eyes onto the understanding that there is hope and that God can do this. And that way when God comes to you and says, hey, what, I'll touch you, but you've got to quit getting high, you'll go, okay. Or when God reaches down and says, I want to set you free, and here's some things that I need you to do to do it. Because, because, you know, what's interesting is that almost all of the promises in the Bible come with ifs. We don't like the ifs. The Bible says, if you'll, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We all get excited, right? You shall know the truth, and we always teach that. We put it on plaques. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What we don't read is the verse before it says, if. <laughs> the one before, if you continue in my word. If you continue in my word, then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We don't put that on the refrigerators. What we put on refrigerators is that God's going to do it. And we leave off. I must prepare. I must make a deliberate effort to see God move in my life. I must make a deliberate effort to see God move in my life. I have to prepare my heart to receive. Some of you, you, you wanna, I'm going to go to church and just let the preacher... Get me, and then I'll, I'll serve you, Jesus. I'll do it. You, you just make me prepared. I remember um, reading the stories of David dancing before the Lord and, and, and worshiping the Lord. And, and I'm almost done, but, but I, I got to share with you. I, I began to go through this process of learning to worship. Um, I, I grew up in an era when break dancing was cool. And I was a break dancer because I like no... No. <laughs> I was trying really hard to learn to spin on my head. Never quite made it, but I was trying. 
and, and dancing, dancing was something you did. And God had begun to pray in my heart. I was in trouble. My life was in, in turmoils. And God got me. He began to change me and transform me. And I began to get involved in church. And, and I began to experience God's moving. And then I, I began to learn about David dancing before the Lord and this presence of God and, and the people just worshiping him and dancing before him. And I remember thinking to myself, I'll do it, Lord, if you make me. I'll do it. You want me to dance? Make me. You're saying, oh, he probably made you. No, he didn't. God is a gentleman. God didn't make me enjoy him. God didn't make me experience his presence. God didn't make me find more of him. God didn't make me move into his presence in a deeper and more powerful way. He invited me. And I remember one time I was at the, this place. They called it the, uh, what was it? The, 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 I can't remember the name of it. I think it was Bronco Bowl. It was a huge dome worship or like a big uh, cathedral uh, musical uh, uh, theater type thing on one end. And on the other end was a big bowling alley. And they called it the Bronco Bowl. It's in Dallas, Texas. And I got invited to a, church, to a multiple church worship service. This was the big boys. This was all the big name uh, 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 preachers and the, and the big worship groups. And this was the big, one of the big things that was going on. I got invited to come. And I went to this big Bronco Bowl worship service. And we're all sitting around there, and the worship is just going on great. And I'm enjoying God's presence because it's just hour after some of the best bands, the best groups, some of the best worship teams in the world were there. And, and, and I mean, we didn't have third day at that time. They were a youth group worship team. <laughs> All right, so these were some of the best worship teams in the world were at this place. And I'm there, and it's just the power of God is moving. Such an incredible experience. And I'm experiencing God in such a powerful way. And I begin, God just began to churn on me and churn on me and churn on me. Man, I just want you, God. I just want you. I just want you. And I remember uh, I, my heart was just so longing to find him. And I, I, I slipped away from the crowd. Everybody was in the worship. And I went around the other side where there wasn't anybody in the stands. And I literally, I crawled out on the floor. I sprawled out on the floor. You know those floors are not clean. But I sprawled out on the floor on my face before God and began to just cry out to him, God, please, I need you in my life. I can't, I cannot be stuck here anymore. I need to be free. My, I began to prepare my heart. I began to say, God, I have to be free. I need you. And I began to cry out to him and cry out to him and cry out to him. And I'm laying out on that floor. Now, part of the reason that I didn't want to dance is because I didn't want to look foolish. All right. I was 17, 18. I was a young man. Looking cool was important to me. All right? And I, I remember I was out there on that pl floor, and I'm just crying out, God, you've got to do something in my heart, trying to prepare my heart, trying to seek him. And I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't aware my heart was being prepared for deliverance. I didn't know that suddenly my deliverance was coming. <laughs> I didn't know that. And I remember I was sitting there and I was struggling and I was still holding back from God. And I would worship God just as stiff as I could, you know. Okay, God, love you. And I'm not telling you, I'm not telling, this was my experience. Yours will be different maybe. Maybe yours will be exactly the same. I don't know. But I remember while I'm crying out to God, I remember he asked me. He said, whose feet are those? These feet? Those are my feet. He says, then you make them dance. You make them dance. So I thought, okay. So I got up and I kind of, you know, gently started dancing. And the spirit began to move and I think, man, pretty quick I'm bouncing around and jumping around and just just having a grand old time worshiping the lord the power of god began to move on i got free to worship god worship services were different from that day on for me i didn't come into a worship service reserved or worried about what anybody else was going to say i didn't care what anybody else was going to say i came to worship to find god i didn't care if the bands played in the right key if they missed a chord if they couldn't sing i came to worship god it changed the worship experience for me forever to this day, it changed my worship experience to me. Because when I worship, I don't care what you think. I don't even typically look at you. Because I'm worshiping God. It changed me forever. Now, God is, is interesting. A couple of things happen. 
I went away from there so changed, and I got back with my group, and I wanted to tell them, man, what God had done. And the lady that brought me, she was like, she knew. She was one of those really radical worshipers, so she was just waiting for me. You know, it's going to happen to him. It's going to happen to him. She said, well, you had a good time. And I thought, how did she know? And then I realized something. When you're in a bowl, and you go to the section where nobody else is, every other person in the bowl can see you. <laughs> and I didn't care because I had been freed. And I thought, yeah, that was fun. Did you see it? <laughs> I didn't look cool at all. But God moved in my life. And if you don't prepare your heart, if you don't set your heart preparation, God's move will come and go by. And you'll be among the millions and the thousands who sit around and say, well, I tried that Jesus thing. I looked into Jesus. It didn't work. It always works. God always works. It isn't that God didn't work. It's that you chose to not prepare your heart to be changed. There are people who come to church with the idea, forget that, I'll find something wrong with this church and that'll be the last time I'll go. There are people who, when they walk in the door, let me tell you something, you may be one of them. You came in this church and somebody drug you in here and you're saying to yourself as you're being drugged in here, nothing's going to happen to me. Not going to make any difference in my life. I'm just going to be in there and then I'm going to be out and I can't wait for him to be done and he won't quit. <laughs> And you get, you may, that may be you. Listen to me. You will miss the greatest thing that will ever happen to you in your life if you do not begin to prepare your heart to allow the creator God, the one who spoke the heavens into existence, the man who created heaven and earth, the one who did all of this for one purpose so that he might have those children who wanted to be with him. Somebody said this one time, listen to me, why would God do this? Why would he create a world? Why would he do all this? Why didn't he just make us serve him? Because if he made you serve God, you'd all be slaves. If he forced you to serve him, you'd be slaves. But God, through Jesus Christ and this thing on earth, prepared a way so that only those people who chose to be with him will be able to be in this next world. God created a system, so if you get there, it's because you wanted to be there. You didn't get to choose being born, but you get to choose whether or not you get to spend eternity with him. Whew, and I'm choosing, yeah. <laughs> I'm preparing my heart to choose to be with him. This message can affect you or it can't affect you, and it's entirely up to you. It's your life. It's your choice. It's, it's, it's entirely up to you completely up to you and, and and let me tell you something there are many of us in this room who are saying to God right now and I'm included in the struggles of my life God in the fact that sometimes it doesn't seem like hope in the fact that it seems hard I'm ready my heart will still be fixed I'm going to deliberately Prepare for victory. I'm going to deliberately prepare to win. I'm going to deliberately plan on things being better. I'm going to be ready. And when you strike the power of God and things explode all around me, I'll stand there and go, I knew it all the time. No, I'll be in awe and let it happen. <laughs> but I'll be ready. God's going to move. God's going to bring freedom. God's going to bring deliverance. God's going to bring his power. And my message to you is very simple. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Because let me tell you something. He is on the scene currently. This isn't some future thing that could happen next week. He is currently in the house. He is currently on the throne. He is at this very moment healing, delivering, and breaking bondages, and bringing people free at this very moment, all over the world, and all over the country, and in every place. He is currently, actively 
doing what he said he would do. When I say prepare the way, it's because suddenly, like today, (laughs) God could change your life forever. Pray with me. Hallelujah. Father God, we come before you because you are on the scene. You're ready. You're willing. You want to move. You want to change. You want to deliver. You're currently prepared to do an incredible work in our lives. And I come to you because, God, I want to prepare the way. I want you to prepare. I want to be ready for your move. God, I'm tired of being where I'm at, and I had no anticipation maybe coming into this place that I would make any kind of decision whatsoever. But today I'm saying, you know what, God? I could use some hope. You know what, God? I could use a change. You know what, God? I could use deliverance. You know what, God? I'm ready for something to happen in my life. And I prepare for you at this moment. Deliberately, I begin to seek you to move on my heart. In Jesus' name, amen.